Hello ladies, gentlemen, and everybody else watching. My name's Eric, and welcome back to a brand new interview here on the Bioshock Hub. Today we have a well-renowned author, we have a well-renowned writer, and author of Bioshock Rapture, along with many other wonderful works. We have Mr. John Shirley. How are you doing today, sir? All right. <laughs> so... We're not, we're not uh, frying in this corner of the United States right now some others we're not uh, we're up in the pacific northwest and we have a nice cool 85 today so that's better i think a lot of people are experiencing <laughs> yeah a lot of people are up in like the 90s pushing 100 and oof. well they say that death valley uh, is expected today to get up to uh, a record for it 125 degrees <laughs> no thank you <laughs> no thank you um so anyways i guess we can first start off what really kind of got you into the whole writing sphere, whether it was, you know, going into TV shows and then books and stuff like that, because obviously you've done stuff like The Crow in the past and you've done other books as well. And we'll get into more books in the uh, future of this video. But what really inspired you to get into that as a career? Oh, it was the only thing I did well. I was a terrible ball player. If I saw a ball coming toward me and I was supposed to catch it with my mitt, um, I just found myself staring at it and imagining a planet spinning in space and forgot all about catching the ball. Um, I, was, uh, uh, I was just better at telling stories than most other things. I could type, I could do a few things, but uh, most of my lo adult life I've been a professional writer um, because it's how I, I was able to flourish in the world and, but also, uh, I'm just kind of one of those people who uh, knew they were a storyteller very early. I used to tell stories to other kids and tell them it was a dream I'd had the night before, but I just made it up so that I could keep them listening to me telling stories when I was like eight, nine, ten. And um, I, when I discovered the library, uh, and you, you know, they'll let, actually let me read all these books for free and uh, I, you know, if, uh, all the uh, big shelf of adventure novels, which, you know, a young boy likes. And I read them and I knew that I could do this. I could feel it. Um, so, I, you know, I started writing short stories when I was uh, like 12, 13 and, and published them in um, underground publications we had we in you know back then there were a lot of uh, independent news organizations of different kinds and and they would sometimes publish fiction and I, I uh, start wrote my first novel when I was 17 and eventually it was published a couple of years later after some revisions um, so I, I just knew that I could do it uh, very early I published short stories professionally when I was 20 and 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 uh, to me that was a door opening to a, a way to live my life almost kind of like a Pandora's box in a way as soon as you well, like it opened was, it, it was, and then you're like oh my god there's so many things I can do now yes but also also it was uh, like Pandora's box a lot of weird things came out uh, from um, my mind on onto the page um, and it was for me exorcising uh, or uh, you know a way to 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 get uh, all the um, dark thoughts and tension and and uh, uh, difficulties that had arisen in a, in my in my youth uh, out in different ways. You know, I was able to um, have an outlet for them. Yeah, it was almost like a. a progressive way to like channel all of that into something productive yeah. rather than something destructive yeah, yeah yeah in many ways and you know i often put it in the form of adventure stories but you can make you can if you're uh imaginative about it you can weave almost any theme you want into an adventure story and so that's why you have you know tolkien's the lord of the rings um uh, sorry about the little technical edit there. Uh, we just had a little interruption, no big deal. 
But anyways, what I was going to ask was how does it go from, you know, short stories being published to when you were like early 20s to all of a sudden getting the opportunity to uh, do the screenplay for like The Crow or, you know, different movies and stuff like that. How did that end up happening for you? Um, well, I published novels and they caught the attention of some people in Hollywood who were interested in them. And they didn't uh, become the bases of movies or television, but if they were still an inroad there. They, they opened doors for me there. And then I also had a, had a, a friend who wanted to become a, a movie producer. And uh, he and I were talking about different projects. And then one day I uh, decided to write something called Angry Angel, which was about a a kind of a, a guy who dies and comes back as a sort of dark angel who takes revenge for uh, himself and people like him. So I sent that to a comic book company, Caliber, and said, um, I'm a writer, I've done these books, and I, I would like to uh, uh, work with you to start a um, uh, saga of Angry Angel if you are interested and they and they wrote back and said yeah it's it looks good but we have something like this it's a little too much like this and uh what's that i said it's called the crow so i went to the store uh, the comic book store and it was black and white comic and in, in uh like the discount bin um and i i uh i bought it and i said yeah this is too much like my story i can't do that he's got this nailed already and and this this is done so well. I really admire the cinematic quality, the movie like quality of James O'Barr's comic strip, The Crow. Um, so I took it to my friend, the would be producer, and um, we got in touch with James O'Barr, and we managed to option it, which you know you pay a little money. Very, you know options can be actually bigger or smaller we paid a relatively small amount for a temporary right to try and sell the book for all of us to uh, uh, a studio in uh, in Los Angeles and um, the first one we tried didn't work out but then we went to um, uh, Edward R. Pressman who, who is a famous producer he produced Wall Street and a lot of other famous films uh, and he looked at it and said, yeah, this already looks like a movie. And that's because the writing in it uh, and, and uh, the dialogue and, and the way it looks on the page, it's very influenced by James O'Barr's uh, love of, of movies, Japanese uh, samurai movies, for example, and all, all kinds of films, noir films. Uh, so it, it already was like storyboard, as they call it in the business, and that sold it basically for, you know, that and the great simple character, the crow, and that was a very modernized kind of um, uh, the shadow or something or, or Zorro kind of character, but very, very contemporary and, and rock and roll inflected. Uh, Pressman loved it. And he set it up uh, with uh, Dimension Pictures, and and it became a movie. And sadly, uh, um, Brandon Lee was accidentally killed during the the thing right before it was finished shooting. Um, that kind of took the wind out of our sails. And I, you know, I can't think back without wishing that there hadn't been more care with the prop guns. Yeah. And, uh, there was it was just an accident with the. Um, uh, the blanks that they used and something stuck in the barrel of a gun. But uh, so it's it's a bittersweet thing thinking about the crow. But, uh, you know, I, it still, uh, I'm, I was the writer of the first four drafts and the treatment, the outline, the first four drafts. And then uh, David Scow, another writer, came on and he took it to another level and uh, together we have uh, credit for writing The Crow. And that opened doors for me so that I was able to work in, in television and um, my book, The Specialist, sold to Warner Brothers and it became one of 
and it became a, a movie with Sylvester Stallone called The Specialist. And uh, I was also writing animation uh, sometimes uh, through these connections. So I wrote a Ghostbusters, the real Ghostbusters animation, for example, and, and others from oh, Robocop. I wrote several of the Robocop animated television shows. And, and that kind of connected me with a lot of other people too. There's, there's connections between anima animation uh, writers and fans and, and video game writers and fans. And then with you, with The Crow, like, for me personally, I don't know about people watching this, because obviously it might have been before their time, too. It was a, roughly a little bit before mine, but it is one of my favorite movies to, like, sit there and actually analyze. And obviously knowing what happened to Brandon Lee after that, you know, God rest his soul, he basically became an icon after that. Like, that one movie was huge. And then also going from that to one of my favorite characters in general, that being Spawn. I seen you did a couple of episodes of that or a couple of yes, takes of that as well. Spawn. So yeah, I worked on the uh the animated version of Spawn and and uh, that was interesting. Uh, it was um a little challenging because the you know the creator of Spawn was always there and so everything has to be filtered through him and uh we kind of, you know, I, he didn't like me to have too many ideas. It seemed to threaten him. But um, I did write some Spawn scripts, and, and I'm glad I did. Um, and, I, 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 you know, the character is very fanciful and cool. Yeah, and just straight up badass. Like, it, he's just a badass. You, you can't deny that. <laughs> A lot of characters are badasses that come from either the movies or other works. He's a works little more on. original in style as a badass. Yes, exactly. Now, going from, you know, animation, let's say, to another form of animation with video games, how were you personally approached to write the Rapture novel? Because, obviously, a lot of people, like I mentioned on the phone, they have taken a huge interest in this. It gives all the backstory of, you know, what happened before Rapture, what happened during, and it just gives a lot of information that the games don't necessarily give. So how were you approached about doing that? How were you approached about, you know, writing the entire, like, storyboard for that? Right. People sometimes, you know, writing to me about it uh, seem to think that you can just decide to write a novel about a video game um, and then write it and they'll just give you money or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you, you have to be asked to write it. Um, and if, you, if you, you can write fan fiction, but if you make any money from it, then you can be sued. Um, so they, my agent called me and said, would you like to do Bioshock Rapture? And I had just played the game. Um, and said yes because I really like that. I, I'm not a, a deep gamer in a lot of ways, but I, I've done quite a bit of gaming, and I loved the uh, the world of of Rapture. I liked the originality of the whole concept, of the feel of the thing. It had its own atmosphere, and, and that you, you just kind of like. A giant leaky being in a giant leaky submarine or something <laughs> and you just feel like any second the pressure is going to make it fly apart and uh and then all the eccentric characters in it um so i was really happy to be asked to do it and by and by tour books and um, then i had to have a meeting on the a phone meeting with um the editor and ken levine uh, and um, a couple of other people um, at the uh, game company and the publishing company. So there was like seven people on the telephone all at once, conference call. Um, they didn't have Zoom then. That, uh, um, and uh, I, uh, you know, had to feel that. You have to, you have to be able to, to um, 
uh, be ready to answer questions from a, a group of people like the, the whole committee. You're kind of grilled a little bit. And I, I knew the game pretty well. Um, and, and I said, well, I've got some ideas for it, but I really want to hear what you guys need. And I'll, I'll try to go there. But, and that's what they really want. They want you to do it, everything within their framework and, and uh, the purview. And, the, and um, so um, uh, after that, I was approved. And a contract was sent to me. And that's the whole story of how I got the gig. You know, then I what originally uh, we were going to only do a sort of story uh, influenced by um, the first game within you know using backstory information from the first game. Um, but then, as uh, after I was three fourths done writing the novel, they called me up and told me we decided we're also going to use Bioshock Two, which is about to come out. So it would be silly not to sort of promote that and use some characters from it. Um, and uh, I was a little um, stressed by that because I hadn't, I had done all this writing and I hadn't incorporated Bioshock 2 because they didn't want me to originally. But um, I adapted. And when you're going to ha take a job, like I wrote for television, you know, uh, for animation, uh, and I've written a, a number of video game novels of different kinds. Borderlands, for example, I wrote uh, a bunch of those. Um, you have to constantly adapt uh, to their needs because even though I, you know, the writer's bringing a lot of creativity to it, uh, it's somebody else's uh, product. It's somebody else's franchise, and they and they're they're very concerned about any. Uh, repercussions on on sales of games or and and by you know for plea they're very concerned to please fans um, and they don't and they have a canon you know what a canon is yep. as, a, as a gamer and as and so um, c a n o n canon and it's you know like all the the bible the rules of a given franchise a, a given world of a video game or a movie or you know, there's a canon for. I also wrote a novel about uh, the Predator, for example, from the Predator movies, um, and there's there's a canon for that. I had to learn. I, I wrote a, a short story for Dungeons and Dragons, so they were doing an anthology, and so I had to. I had knew nothing about D Dungeons and Dragons, so they sent me some books, and I had to study it, um, and they paid me well, so. I, and it, it was, and it, and it is fun and interesting because you know it's, it's more fun and interesting having having to read uh, all about the the details of the world of a video game than it than it is, uh, you know, to have to uh, uh, absorb the rules of, of working as an accountant or or um, not putting accountants down. Most of them love their jobs, uh, but for me. You know, I, I, anything that is, that is story oriented and has a, and it has like the the glamour and detail of a world, I get I get drawn in anyhow. So, it, it, it although it is it is hard work, it's work that I do enjoy. Yeah, I would say I, I imagine it's very rewarding, especially when you receive that reception like the fans give with this book. And I think a lot of the reason why people gravitate towards it and really enjoy it. It's just because of the attention to detail and in obviously collaboration with you and the writers and the creators and stuff like that. It was very well put together and it was very like insightful. So uh, I guess from us Bioshock fans, thank you and everybody else that made that possible. So that was, it was wonderful. I'm glad it's out there. <laughs> glad it's out there and the people are still reading it. It's been, been translated into a lot of different languages. So now with this combining the first and part of the second game, were there any sort of talks about potentially writing a novel for the third game, that being Infinite? Or was I it... I never heard from it. I, I never heard anything uh, about that. And, and I think Levine himself did one, didn't he? I'm he did, not he entirely sure. One. He co-wrote one with someone. Um, he, he worked with another writer and co-wrote one. Because I 
kind of brought maybe a little too much of my own ideas to Bioshock for his liking. Maybe even though I, I didn't step on any of his, I, I uh, stuck within his, his canon, his structure. Um, but uh, you know, he, 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 creative people can be very uh, protective of their works and also competitive. And so um, maybe there was just a little feeling of that going on. But we didn't really fight or anything about it. I just feel like he, he wanted the thing to be more, the next novel to be more an outgrowth of his vision of how it should be a novel. And they did do one, I think, based on, on uh, Bioshock Infinite, as I recall. Okay. Um, and uh, I didn't read it, but I liked all the Bioshock games. Out of all the ones that you've played in terms of like being able to come up with a story, let's say you were able to just, you know, disregard copyright for just a little bit, you know, just a little, which game do you think you would be able to like perfect your own story with, with your own ideas, your own creative freedom, no directors, creators, anything like that, just you. Which Bioshock? Yes. Game? Yes. That at, at least you've experienced. Well, the one where they're up in the sky. That, I, I really love that conception. And um, uh, it's Bioshock Infinite, right? Yes. And um, um, I liked the, oh, the kind of uh, steampunk flavor of it. Um, the, and the and kind of, it's, in, it's relationship to, to, uh, and history and and politics and and uh, uh, where you take the the craziness that arises in humanity and and then you project it into this weird world floating in the sky, so uh, and they they realized it pretty darn well. They made it made it seem almost kind of sort of believable that it could happen, uh, and that's good enough. It's called internal logic and. Just making sure that that the the uh, reader or player, in this case the gamer, um, will give you the necessary suspension of disbelief. They suspend it if they really like the idea, and they say, "I su suspend my disbelief. I'm gonna believe in this because this is fun." Um, and it, but you need internal logic to do it. It has to it has to everything has to seem like within that world it's logical. And they did that in Bioshock Infinite and with all the Bioshock stories, uh, with Bioshock 1 and 2. And, um, I really like, though, writing about Rapture, uh, partly because of the wonderful atmosphere. But uh, also there, there was the, um, the themes floating around in the background. I mean, Ryan... Uh, is, is sort of uh, a libertarian gone mad. He's he his name is an anagram of Ayn Rand, as you probably read somewhere. And she's yep. she was a a novelist and a social theorist and uh, into the virtues of selfishness and so on. She was very you know, she's like a hero of the libertarians who believe that the free market solves everything, and you find that. In, in the, um, the setup and the ideas behind um, Ryan's rapture. He, he was, he's a believer the free market will, will solve anything as long as we're left alone and I've created this world so I can do things my way uh, under the sea where nobody will interfere with me and we'll have a totally free market. And, and then of course, um, uh, events, you know, reach their logical conclusion where the uh, when you don't have any regulation on the marketplace, um, madness ensues, and and um, uh, and you have in in the real world you have things like uh, the uh, a river uh, that caught fire. Um, you remember that? Hearing about that? That was in the in the Midwest where where you live. Yep. Um, and because of the, the extremity of the pollution in the river and. Um, uh, we have we have uh, 
runaway climate change now, and we and we we have uh, all uh, giant patches of, of plastic floating in the Pacific Ocean, um, the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, they call it plastic patch, um, and so you know there when whenever uh, big marketplaces are not regulated, um, not throttled, you know, not crushed, just regulated, like the rules in baseball. How, how much fun would it be to play baseball if there were no rules? Exactly. You know? It'd be and cheap. Somebody would, somebody would come after you with the baseball bat and knock you down. You know, you, you got to have the rules. Um, and so uh, in Bioshock Rapture, we see what happens when you don't have the rules uh, for the for uh, the the game that is that is a world creation, and the game that is the great marketplace that, that Ryan was trying to create, um, and uh, uh, then you know uh, uh, in the next game we have uh, Sophia Lamb, who sort of went to the other extreme, and and she was reacting by by creating uh, a, a, a hyper socialist organization and, and kind of very, you know, uh, nefarious in the way it did things. So that, you know, we, then then you see the, the other extreme of, of society uh, parodied in Bioshock 2. And I went into some of those themes in the novel Bioshock Rapture. We see the, the problems with um, no regulation and the problems with uh, maybe t maybe too much power centralized. He, obviously, society thrives when there's structure, but um, uh, as much freedom as common sense will allow. Yeah, of course. Uh, have you ever thought about writing a game? Has that ever like? Well, I have mind? done a little. I've I worked on a Sega game called Mr. Bones briefly uh, that nobody remembers it. I worked on a Star Trek game uh, and er well, this is one of the, I think this is the first Star Trek game that I, as far as I know, uh, for a company in Alameda. Um, and uh, I wrote dialogue um, for them and cut scenes. And it wasn't a big part of my career, but I did some and I got paid and then uh, few years ago, well, well, no, it's about eight years ago now, I was a consultant on for Telltale Games for a Borderlands uh, reboot that they, that they wanted to do. And um, so I had a little cubby in their um, headquarters where I reported every day and sat and waited to be consulted with <laughs> and, made, and just wrote whatever I wanted. And I tried to provide a lot of material for them um, that they could just select and work with. And, and that was a, a kind of a longish temporary job of many months. And I was very well paid and it was very interesting. Interesting to see a game company from the inside like that, see the, the culture of the game company. So they all have their own culture in terms of the way people interact. They all, you know, some, some are a little more, uh, friendly to the employees yes some are notoriously um prone to exploiting them and making them work crazy hours and and um you know some have a, a famous famously bullying attitude toward the employees i won't name the ones but there's a famous one in california yeah people know people know if you <laughs> if you know you know <laughs> Um, other than that, I believe that is all of the questions I really wanted to ask. I wanted to get more into like the early career, bring everybody up to speed, talk a little bit about the books. And now I know you want to talk about what's next or just current. So if you would like to mention those books that we were talking about and stuff like that, the floor is yours for the rest of the time, my friend. Well, uh, I've continued to write books uh, since Bioshock Rapture. Uh, besides um, work for higher world novels, I've written um, novels uh, just simply of my own creation for Torah books and other major publishers uh, like Oblique History and, and uh, Crawlers is another one. Uh, Crawlers is a, a horror novel. Um, and uh, 
there, so then, uh, you know, all, all this time uh, I had this novel in mind that was gestating uh, because of the way things were changing in the world uh, meteorologically. We were having more and more extreme weather. Um, I wrote a short story about that called uh, um, The Kindest Man in, Sh in Stormland that was published um, in a, uh, a British magazine, Interzone. And um, that got a lot of good attention. So I, I decided to try and make it the, uh, the basis, the springboard for a novel, incorporated into a novel about Stormland. And Stormland is a place where uh, uh, 24 7, 365 days a year, there are extreme storms. It's a 500 square area around uh, Charleston, South Carolina in the future. And uh, so every day there's a hurricane or a lightning storm uh, or some other very extreme storm, but generally just waves of hurricanes, one after another. And I explain uh, in the book how this can happen, not just because there's more extreme weather in the world as a result of anthropogenic man-caused uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, the, this, the consequences of that can lead to pockets of extreme weather that are worse than in other parts of the world. So if you have a lot of uh, heating of the ocean in a certain area, it'll lead to a big currents change. And the current changes, changes of big ocean currents has a lot to do with weather and it can lead to repeated storms in a given area, at least in theory. Um, and, but my main idea was that once you've established storm land, well, of course, everybody's going to leave, right? Constant hurricanes, but perhaps some don't. Perhaps there are a few people who stay and some who come in for their own reasons in this very dangerous place. So who would do that and why? What are they up to? And what is life like in a place that, where there are constant storms? Uh, and this, the novel is a sort of near future science fiction detective novel. Um, as, as, as a former um, US Marshal comes into town um, looking for a serial killer who's hiding there and finds a lot of other very strange things going on um, that are even worse than the serial killer. Uh, and there are many peculiar little pocket societies in, in there that are um, have a lot of friction between them uh, and, and, uh, and, and diff their own way of, of uh, living with one another, their own economy and so on. Um, and so that's Stormland essentially and that came out from Blackstone Books uh, last year and it, the hardcover uh, sold out pretty much so they now it's in a trade paperback yep and it's in under consideration as a possible miniseries for television but I can't say anything more about that and you never know I've had a lot of things considered to be miniseries <laughs> my novel Demons was picked up by Dimension um, and they, you know, gave me a really good chunk of money for the option on it. Uh, and then they rebought the option after the option had run out after a certain amount of time went by. And they had a, a director and a script done. And then uh, the recession of 2008 came along and they had to throw out most of their projects um, for the company to survive and just focus on stuff they knew was going to generate cash right away. So it was so close to being a movie, um, but uh, it didn't happen. And now there's other people interested in it. Good. Demons is, is about when um, giant demons, I mean, you know, really big, like 200, 300 feet tall, um, they, they invade the earth uh, as, as a group. And each one is a different weird personality. Um, so it, it is a pretty high concept, pretty premise based book and a lot of terrifying and in imagery in it. And then I know you also wanted to talk about really, 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 really yeah. emphasis on the last really short stories. So would you mind doing that real quick? Yeah. The book is called 
really, 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 four reallys, <laughs> weird stories. And um, there's a, uh, it's my latest story collection, and it's also an old one that I kind of revamped and brought new stories into and re-edited. Um, and it, the premise is that they're, they're, the book is divided into four sections, and each section is weirder than the last one, than the previous one. So the first section is really weird stories, and they are weird, really weird. The section after that is really, really weird stories. The third section is really, really, really weird stories. And the fourth section is really, 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 really weird stories. <laughs> and so the reader can decide if they agree with this um, evaluation of it or not. Uh, but it, it sold very well and got great reviews. And uh, uh, and now with this new edition from Jack and Apes Press, um, I, you know, uh, there's a lot of interest in it. It's kind of, it can be pre-ordered at Jack and Apes Press. But it's my next story collection. And I also have a story collection that just came out about six months ago, just brand new things. Um, called uh, The Feverish Stars. And uh, I have a uh, techno thriller coming from Titan Books uh, having to do with uh, the mili uh, military combat in orbit in the, in the, um, uh, the near future, something like 2045. And it's uh, it's pretty intense action, um, and but it, the it, I also you know am a am a science fiction writer and one of the original cyberpunk writers. I wrote a, uh, a cyberpunk trilogy, uh, the A Song Called Youth trilogy that's still out from Dover Books, and uh, so you know I've always had this connection with with trying to see the practical and the military. Uh, and the and the human um, interactions that are going to happen when a sudden technology comes swarming in on us. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it it explores that a lot. And we see a, a lot of new futuristic coming military um, technology, uh, most of which people don't know about, and some which uh, is still... Okay, so, uh see. We're, um, I think we left off. You were talking about like the future technology and some of the modern technology and stuff like that kind of meeting together. Right. Well, I was, yes. Um, yeah. So some suborbital suborbital seven um, is, is about uh, new advances in uh, perceptive perceptual technologies um, and their exploitation in, in the military realm in space, uh, mostly. And it has to do with a, a special kind of orbiter that um, is, is theoretically to be used, and this is probably going to happen uh, in real life, where you're sending up a, 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 uh, a troop of men um, in this, in our case, um, Army Rangers, uh, Army Airborne Rangers, and um, the orbiter flies to uh, a trouble spot, um, but for, in orbit, you, they they get right above it in orbit, and you can you can move really rapidly in orbit. So let's say you're in the USA, and you can get your orbiter, which is fueled and ready all the time. Up to uh, up to lower orbit, sub orbit, and uh, then you you fly it th through orbit across the um, uh, the, the uh, sphere of the planet. You know, uh, over to let's say in this case um, Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, you can be there in a really relatively short time overhead. And then you drop from overhead sort of straight down. You can't do it completely straight, but enough so that it really reduces your uh, likelihood of being sensed by radar because you're just a little passing blip for most radar things that would vanish because you're going straight down almost. 
and then you have a system that allows you to break and come in for a landing um, even from that steep dive and then you land near the trouble spot and then you have uh, the back of the thing opens and um, what are called light terrain vehicles in, in my story are used and they and you can drive them out of the back of this really enormous space plane um, and to the uh, point where you want to um, uh, attack the enemy and you can you can, if you do it right you can often even get an element of surprise and you could certainly surprise them by bringing uh, quite a few um, highly dangerous uh, special operative uh, soldiers, spec ops, um, to uh, a uh, the, the vicinity of, of uh, your target really rapidly, um, and th so it's kind of like a. It's called in the book. It's called a drop heavy project, and you drop heavy on the enemy from above, you know, like that, uh, and your force spreads out before they can even hardly react, uh, and it's, it can be. And then you can you can take off from, from there too because of the special uh, way that the orbiter is designed, all of which is described in the novel Suborbital 7. Be sure to pick it up. Link will be in the description. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's coming from Titan Books in June. Other and, than that? Uh, oh. You can, you know, uh, I, I just, you see, if you don't ask me questions, then I talk too much. That's the problem. <laughs> That's so the whole point have, of the interview. You have, there's anything that you... <laughs> else that you you want to ask um if you know like for example what award did i win and why what award did you win and would you like to explain the origins behind it as well i'm glad you thought of asking me that i'm glad Paul. you reminded me thank you sir because <laughs> <laughs> i cannot pronounce it to save my life so i would Bram butcher that Stoker award um Bram Stoker was the author of Dracula, the novel that spawned so much of, uh, of the vampire genre, and uh, and also was was a classic horror novel, and and it is given the award, the Bram Stoker Award is given by the Horror Writers Association, so you know people like Stephen King and uh, have received them, and and Clive Barker. And I got one for uh, my story collection, Black Butterflies, A Flock on the Dark Side. Uh, and it was, and it, this book is in a new edition. Um, this is why I'm mentioning it now. It's in a new edition that you could find uh, at Amazon and, um, and both uh, paperback and as an ebook. And it's 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 um, it's horror stories with sometimes technological inflection. I've never had a problem with jumping from the genre of horror to the genre of science fiction and back, and also finding the uh, sort of uh, twisted Twilight Zone where they can combine, and uh, that can be found in um, Black Butterflies. So that's way too many projects uh, to have talked about already. No, not at all. Not at all. It's uh, just... Black Butterflies and Suborbital 7. Uh, maybe in my next book I'll make... I give it a title It's easier to pronounce. Suborbital <laughs> 7. See if you can say Suborbital 7 five times. No, better not. Yeah, that's a challenge for you in the comments. But, yeah, we were just, like I said, when we were talking on the phone, I would like for you to actually speak. That's what people are here for. They want to listen to you speak. So giving all of this, you know, insight about the backstories of the stories or just a little bit about yourself in general, it means a lot to a lot of people. And you might not realize that now, but if you come back to the interview and let's say a couple of months, you might have inspired people to go down that path of writing. So it's a wonderful thing you're doing and again thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this for us it means a lot happy to be here uh, I like your style you you run a good interview thank you sir I really do appreciate that that means a lot to me um, other than that would there be anything else that you would like me and the audience to know whether it's a website where people can contact you to say like hey thank you for writing this or I'm a big well, fan if you here Google me you'll Besides the Wikipedia thing, you'll you'll come to John 
hyphen uh, Shirley.com. And there's a pretty good website there. It was created by some fans, and then I contribute to it. There's a blog there and everything. Um, and it gives news and so on. And uh, I'm pretty bo I'm pretty Googleable. There's <laughs> another another word, a non-word really, Googleable. It's fun That's to say though. To pronounce, but I I manage that one, Googleable. Googleable. At least it's fun to say. So, <laughs> anyways, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this. If you guys do enjoy, you know, Bioshock Rapture, which obviously the majority of you do. Be sure to check out some of the other books that were mentioned. I will leave a majority of them in the description if you want to pick them up and support John Shirley. That would be very much appreciated on both my end and I'm sure his as well. The links to those will be down in the description along with that website. So again, thank you for being here. And with that being said, take care, stay safe, and I will talk to you all in the next one. See you, everybody.